that's how the LiDAR plane operates. You have the laser on the plane. Uh, you've seen slides like this many times. Um, but what exactly happens, so you have the plane, you have, in our case, a tree, maybe a bird, and then that LiDAR shoots. And uh, now you see a standing beam. And you may think of Enterprise, you know, beam me up, Scotty, and something. No, it's not like that. There's no standing beam. You never see the beam. What is shot is a, is a small burst of light, uh, a, a bunch of photons, and, and they are about as uh, four nanoseconds, a burst of light. It's about that long in the air. And when it hits the ground, it's about that wide. It's like a blob with the most photons in the middle and then you know less photons left and right. So that travels down this trajectory and then gets reflected. Why does it get reflected? Because it hits things. It may hit a bird. Now, if that bird is not a bird, but a little bird, but a very big thing like a, a dragon, yeah, <laughs> then the laser stops right there. Any Game of Thrones fans here? Yeah. <laughs> One of Kalishi's dragons. Then it stops there. No more penetration because it just bounces off the back and goes back to the plane. But there are not that many dragons flying right now. So often the laser continues on and will hit several other things. And as long as there is enough energy left, it will continue to penetrate. And maybe it even hits the ground. What you see here is the best possible scenario where we have a number of tree returns and we get the ground return. That's unfortunately not that often the case. Often, even without dragons, it will stop maybe here already because very dense leaves and no more light can continue. Or it will maybe after one, two, three hits, there's not enough energy left. So we don't get the ground return. This ground return is the one we really always want. No matter who you are, if you're an archaeologist, a geologist, a, um, a forester, or a hydrologist, you always want the ground return. Because that, for forestry, that gives us a reference how high the vegetation is above the ground. And the geologists, they usually only care about this. And archaeologists, they don't, they want to throw away the vegetation. The yellow ones is one shot, one return. So whenever you hit a hard surface, like the laser hits, there wouldn't be a ceiling, uh, or parking lot, a uh, soccer field. Uh, ah, I shouldn't mention soccer, sorry. Ah. <laughs> Just an open field, <laughs> tennis court. Uh, um, you get a single return. Um, along in the vegetation areas, you get more than one return. And here I show the, the first returns. You can press F on the keyboard. The first returns are shown red. And the last returns, you can press L, are shown blue. So if you go um, F, L, F, L, you kind of see the laser penetration in a way. Because you see it going from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree. And by the way, how did I get to this coloring? I get to this coloring through color by return. Or you can press C on the keyboard. C. You press C enough many times until you get there. Because C is going through all the possible color options. Now I press A, I have all the returns again. And very clearly what you can see also is first returns, L, F, and L, last returns. And you can see I'm not always penetrating to the ground. Sometimes the last return is up here in the middle of the tree. So one thing I would like to point out, and I repeat that a few times, last returns are not ground returns. Uh, the ground returns, the ones we always hope to get, are usually a subset 
of the last returns. And especially in forested areas, it's often a very small subset. And we use filtering algorithms, uh, in this case last round, or classification algorithms, last round, to get the ground. What I've noticed in forestry a few times, and that's why that, you see, when you look from above, when you look from above, what should you see? Which colors should you see? Well, I should see yellow when it's an open field or a, a, a house roof or a street. And I should see red if it's a forest. And I have multiple, because that's the first return. The first return is either yellow when it's the only return, or it's red when it's the first of many. Now, sometimes I've seen LiDAR data sets, and that's the first set part of quality checking where I see um, it looks a bit more like this. I don't see first return, or I see, I see some areas where I can see blue. Um, and that means somebody cut off the first returns. If I'm, if I'm looking from above, I should always see either red or yellow. If I see any blue, larger amount of blue or green, that means somebody cut off the first returns. Why would somebody do that? Oh, because the company you you hired, they were flying, and sometimes they hit clouds. So the first return doesn't come from a dragon or from a bird, it comes from a cloud, and that can be a lot of first returns. You can basically scan the entire cloud. And then they know the customer doesn't want the cloud, so they just cut out the cloud. But the cloud is the first return, so you lose the first returns, and then under the cloud, it turns blue. And you basically can see the shape of the cloud sometimes in blue. And for forestry, that's not very good if you don't know about it, because under clouds, you have less penetration, you have different intensities, and the return distribution is different. Which means if you make metrics, they will be different on the clouds. And that's why, especially for forestry, I always point out how to figure out if there are any cut-off clouds. Because you have to treat those areas different. Okay. What else can you do with last view? You can press X. And if you press X once, you can uh, select an area. And if you press X again, then this area becomes sort of the, the small area you're only looking at. And I'm changing colors now. And then you can walk around with the arrow keys. Uh, that's useful sometimes to make a visual inspection of your LiDAR data set. With X, you can switch back and forth. And I, I can now walk. I can walk here with the arrow keys, you know, up, down, left, right. And I can also walk here, it's the same walk. And by pressing T, you can triangulate the data. And then you can walk, you can triangulate again. Walk, pressing T. Uh, the, the X, you press X once. You come into that mode where you can select an area. And X always goes back between two modes. And I press X again, and then I should be focused on that area. And uh, with T, I can triangulate. And with T, I triangulate again. So these are just ways of inspecting your data. Um, sometimes it's useful to, uh, you can also get rid of the triangulation with capital T, shift T, then you remove it. Uh, sometimes people want to make a transect like that, press X, and then you can, uh, you can walk through your data like that and look for funny noise points or a visual inspection is usually useful when you suspect there is something strange. 
But looking at LiDAR data is really not LiDAR processing. Uh, we, we will look at LiDAR data a couple of times. That's why I wanted you to get used a little bit to the, the viewer. Okay. LAZ is one of, it's probably the most successful piece of software I've ever written. Is the compressor called Last Zip. And uh, because that's what I did my PhD on. I did my PhD on compressing things. You always compress things like air or sleeping bags. But we often compress also uh, documents and audio and video. And I focused on compressing geometry for my PhD. And then nobody ever used what I did. Because who, who really compresses triangle meshes on a regular basis? Uh, but then I discovered these LiDAR points when they were huge. So I thought, oh, I'll use some of my techniques to compress the points instead of the triangles or the polygon meshes. And I wrote this compressor here called LASIP. And I put it out there. And at the same time, and I feel really bad for the company, there was a company investing a lot of research and development time into com developing a LiDAR compressor. They, the company is big in compressing satellite images, but they made a very poor marketing uh, choice by getting out the first day. Nobody was using any compression, except WinZip. And they started with a $3,000 price on day one. And I had a zero dollar price. What happened is that last zip has become sort of almost a standard. Almost every software is now using it. And the most important part of this is not that it compresses very well and it's very fast and it's very robust. The most important part is it has a good license. And I don't think compression is something you should be making money with. Because compression, you compress content. And content is only useful if it can be shared. And compression that you have to pay for makes it difficult to share. And that lowers the value of your data. So I really uh, I think that was a, I mean, I didn't plan this to become so successful. It kind of surprised me myself. But now LAZ is a compressed format. And if you look at LAS files, for example, then LAZ, if everything goes well, you can compress it down to as little as 9%. And uh, almost every company supports it now. And almost every country that makes open LiDAR or that transfers large amount of data puts it online in LAZ format. Uh, Finland, Denmark, Holland, England, pretty much every data in the US except one or two states use a different format. Okay, so that's LAZ. That's why we mainly work with LAZ and not LAS. But it's a lossless compression, so the files are pretty much identical. The content is just more compact.